Hey, Mike Lake, altobone.com. If you're a beginning improviser, or maybe you're not a beginner, maybe you've been at it for a while and you're struggling with it, and maybe you've all but given up on ever doing it well, this video is for you. Now, it's also for you if you've been spending time and money trying to learn the, you know, the chord scale relationships and patterns in all 12 keys through lessons or online courses and books, and you're still struggling with how to improvise. Well, imp first of all, let me be honest, improvising is hard. You know, just playing your instrument well is hard. Now, take that and add spontaneous composition coordinated with drums and bass and piano cooking along with you, right? But in this video, I want to show you a hack for making improvisation much simpler than you are probably making it right now. And what I'll show you works for many standard tunes. The one I'm going to demonstrate this hack to today is a Jimmy Van Heusen and Johnny Mercer tune called I Thought About You. Here's the lead sheet to that tune. Now, at first glance, the changes make it look like a complicated tune. You know, I mean, just the first two bars contains four chords. We're already off to a bad start. What do I do with those four chords? So here's a question. And from the answer comes the hack that I'm going to show you. Can this entire tune be boiled down to just one key, one major scale? Well, the answer is yes. And as I said earlier, this can be done with many tunes. Now, some you may need two keys, some you may need three. There are those where you're going to jump around constantly and the simplification of it is much more hard, much more difficult. But for now, let's explore boiling a tune down like I thought about you into one key, one major scale. Now, before we dive in, let me warn you that the more experienced jazz players and the more technically analytical players are going to poke holes in this. They're going to say that this tune is, in fact, more than one key and you can't just play over it with the key of E flat. And they'd be partially right, technically. And soon I'm going to take a, a brief moment to prove their point for them. Uh, but at the same time, I want to show you that because of how close that root key is to the exceptions, you can get away with one key, one major scale. Now, why is this useful? Well, I, if it's not obvious, it's useful because you have a much better chance of standing up and soloing if you all you have to think about is just three flats, right? The key of E flat. The other night at a rehearsal, one of the trombone players who's you know somewhat scared of improvising because he doesn't really know how, he was asking me what he should play over the changes of a tune that was uh, kind of a D minor blues. And I told him, play F major, one flat. And then I brought him over to the piano player to demonstrate how that might fit in with the changes. But before I knew it, the piano player was saying, now here you play the D Dorian, and then here you play the altered uh, diminished chord, and then the harmonic minor, and then you modulate. To, oh. and, and the piano player, who's a friend of mine, he wasn't wrong. He's a brilliant guy, but as I said to him later, when I kind of took him aside, I said, everything you ran through that trombone player was completely lost on him. He doesn't even know what a diminished scale is. So rather than giving him something simple with which to give him a bit of confidence to, to stand up and create melodies, um, like just playing F, you've loaded him down with something completely complex that will freeze him in his tracks. And he'll continue to be afraid of improvisation and never do it. Remember, this is, this, is the, this is the saying for this whole video. Perfect is the enemy of good. Now, before I dive into the hack and demonstrate this to you, let's be fair to those who say I'm oversimplifying things. And I want to show you their point of view because I never want anyone to come away from one of my videos saying, Mike Lake says changes don't matter, theory schmeary, right? What I am showing you is a step towards standing up and improvising with confidence while you play a bunch of right notes. So let's take a quick look at the circle of fifths. Here it is. The circle tells you how closely related or far the various keys are. So nearby keys are related and something that's like all the way across the circle is very unrelated. Now I have an ebook called Circle of Fifth Savvy in my store at altobone.com. And that book helps you understand key relationships in this way. And in the end, it's going to help you improvise easier over changes. So you should check that out. Now, here's the key of E flat major.
I'm not going to go through the entire tune bar by bar and do a complicated harmonic analysis. I'm quickly going to do the work for you and just let you know that out of this 32 bar tune, there are 14 bars of E flat major, which is a little less than half the tune. And I'm counting its relative minor of C minor in that grouping and a, a couple of passing chords in the first ending. A flat's neighbor, B flat, and its relative minor G minor has 10 bars of the tune. B flat's neighbor, F major, is in four beats, if you count it as a dominant leading to the F7 in bar two. So almost three quarters of the tune is either one, two, or three flats. E flat's other neighbor on the other side, A flat, is in four bars. And we're left with just two remaining, but admittedly distant keys. One bar of G major and three bars of G flat major. That G flat is a bit of a distant key, but yet it still shares four notes with the key of E flat. Um, a flat, B flat, E flat, and F. Almost half the G flat major scale. So look at the cluster of keys around E flat major. Even with the two distant keys of G and G flat, you can still play a very melodic solo just using E flat major over the entire 32 bar form. Now, this isn't magic, and you still have to keep your ears open because as you merrily go along in three flats and then hit, you know, I don't know, the F7 in bars three and four, A flat is going to be a tough sounding note. But I'm going to talk about how to anticipate those situations in a little bit. Now, that was a lot of theory in a very short amount of time. And the focus of this video is on the opposite, making it simple. So I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to use my men in black flashy thing to uh, help you forget all of that theory. And uh, because simply playing in three flats is going to get you off and running on playing a terrific solo. And yes, I have this as an app and I'm going to see you on the other side. Hey, Mike Lake here with altobone.com. I've got a hack to play over the entire form of the standard I thought about you coming up right now. All right, so I'm messing with you a little bit, but the point I'm trying to make here is I'm trying to distinguish all the theory from keeping it simple. And I really do want to show you something simple here. And, and, and the simpleness of it is in just playing three flats through the tune. It doesn't work through every single change as I just showed you, but it works for enough of it to kind of set you free and be able to improvise in a way that's melodic and easy and that you feel you have some control over. So let me demonstrate that. And I've recorded a track just in E flat and I've linked to it down below. And the track is E flat major to B flat seven, E flat major, B flat seven, and on and on and on. And don't worry, the B flat seven is in three flats. It's just a little bit of a way to give a little variety rather than something boring like E flat through the whole thing. So practice with that. And don't just start on E flat, go to E flat and practice your scales like you normally do. Cause for improvisation, you know, that's, that's fairly lame. Start on another note, Go to some other note, play around with it. Don't just limit yourself to whole and half steps like a traditional scale. Instead, immerse yourself in the key of E flat. You can play normal scales and the patterns and maybe Clark studies and whatever you're used to playing, but also branch out and, and, and expand some intervals. The point of being able to, to just play an E flat is you don't have to think about a whole lot. So it gives you a chance to stretch out. So let's, let's, let's try this. I'm going to play over the E flat track. I'm probably going to play about eight bars. And then when I get done, I'm going to superimpose it onto the chord changes of I thought about you. And let's just test to see if this theory uh, is going to work. So that will sound something like this. Okay, let's see what that sounds like. Um, I'm gonna, like I said, I'm gonna play that over the changes uh, to I Thought About You. So let's see what that sounds like. All right, so I'm going to mute the major, E-flat e major uh, backing track, and we're going to open up the Thought About You changes. Here's the, the first track I played. Let's hear what that sounds like. 
doesn't sound bad. That's pretty cool. Let's move this up eight bars. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now this is likely to be some trouble because this is the part where we've got A flat major, we've got A flat minor, A flat minor, D flat seven. some problems but uh, you know this is this is a great lesson and you know I like to say that you can play any note over any change well this is an example where you know you've got you got passing tones that may not be great but as long as you recover in the next note and the note after that you know kind of all is forgiven uh, let's move it up randomly now let's just see what this might sound like <laughs> Yeah, that kind of sounds like it meant to, it was meant to be there. Let's go to the end where we have some more problems with A flat minor. Let's see what we can sound here. Now that doesn't really count. That's the top of the head. Let's move this two bars up. I mean that's that's uh, that's kind of odd sounding, but again, no one's going to get arrested for that one. I also recorded two other tracks. Um, this one down here, just to prove that you can do this with just plain old quarter notes, and yes, starting on E flat and just doing thirds and intervals. Let's see what that sounds like. <laughs> That doesn't sound bad. Let's just randomly put that somewhere. Yeah, there's some, some issues there, but you know, not terrible. Move it up. What's that sound like? Interesting. Um, last thing I did was uh, I did like a Clark etude um, just to show the classical guys that they can join in on the fun as well. Let's see what that sounds like. Oh, let's not do it with the other one. Let's do it here. You know, and obviously I'm not pushing this as a way to improvise, but just to kind of try and make the point that kind of any note you play, uh, for the most part, will probably work. Let's randomly place this somewhere. All right, not great. The second part was kind of better. One more time. <laughs> that was better. That was cool. All right. I think there's a couple of interesting ideas here. One is that you can simplify a tune by just figuring out the common denominator key. Now for this one, it was E flat, and you can discover that by looking at the tune's key, the last note, maybe, uh, and then you can look at the keys laid out on the circle of fifths. The circle can tell you a lot. I have a, a book called Jazzier Savvy, and in it, I analyzed six standards, and I mapped out where the, the key centers were in the circle of fifths, and you can see very quickly which tunes will be harder to play over and why by looking at the circle. The other interesting idea 
is further proof that you can play any note over any chord as long as you recover. And, and recover just means resolving phrases in a musical and purposeful way. So if you play G over A minor, it matters what you play next. So this works. You know, it's not perfect. But I think what is perfect is, is its ability for you to just freely express yourself playing your instrument without having to think about the chord that's coming up in five seconds and the bridge that's coming up in a little bit and what key is that and you know all the things that are weighing on your mind that are keeping you from standing up and expressing yourself you'll develop the ability to weave your way back into the more complex changes and to anticipate when you get to a flat minor not to play c and when not to play g but for now use this as an exercise just to, to express yourself and, and play melodically and there are other tunes you can do this with. Um, uh, Autumn Leaves, playing B-flat major, the whole tune. Yeah, there's F-sharp in there, but that's okay. You'll hear it. You'll begin to anticipate some of those, those tones outside of the main uh, 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 tonal center. And look for other, other tunes you can do this with and, and practice it that way. And record yourself and listen to the exceptions and, oh, that note doesn't really work. Why? Look at the chords. This is how you learn to play jazz. So. Good luck with this. Play the tracks down below, the, the, the E flat track and the rhythm track to the tune. And I'd love to hear what you find from this and if it's helping. Thanks. Thank you.